As Fiona said, um, she'd asked me to present um, on choice of therapy and like some of the different patient populations or where you have clinical ch changing scenarios so that you might want to be adjusting doses. So things, yeah, just a little bit out the norm. Um, and she's also asked me to present a couple of medicine information queries. You know, that's what we do as part of our service. So I'll use a couple of those to um, run through information about combinations of medicines. And I guess just a bit of disclaimer, although Fiona's already mentioned it, like I'm not, I don't work in a smoking cessation service. I'm not like patient facing at the moment. Um, yeah, so this is based on a literature search or just approaches that we take to answering queries and we'll get them in the pharmacy. So based on a few discussions with Fiona about what might be, you know, some of the um, more popular questions that come up in terms of when do we need to think, rethink our normal medicine um, choice strategy. We're going to be running through pregnancy, breastfeeding, renal impairment, and then also, um, you know, do you need to do anything differently with people just had a heart attack? That's, you know, often a point at which people are thinking about, do I need to stop smoking or I should be stopping smoking? Um, and then mental health clients as well. And so a couple of medicine information queries. So pregnancy and breastfeeding, uh, obviously best choice if possible is not to use any medicines, um, to try and use non-pharmacological means. But if you are wanting to um, choose some therapist in help in supporting all the in behavioral interventions that you're wanting to do, like what is the most appropriate to go for? And I'm mainly basing the presentation now on safety rather than effectiveness, so I'm coming from that perspective. So the New Zealand guidelines, um, I guess, were fairly straightforward and quite simple. Um, you know, pregnant or breastfeeding women cannot use three medicines, so we've immediately <laughs> just struck out a whole lot of medicines that John's just been talking about, and that might be really useful for some people, particularly if they've already tried things like NRT. So it's just then like looking a little bit further in terms of you know what other information is there out there? You know, can we use them, or you know, what are the risks? So we can have some more of those conversations. So this is um, a summarised version of what's in the New Zealand formulary, uh, which expands you know, beyond what was in uh, the national guidelines. And just as a bit of a side, for the new, um, if you've not used the New Zealand formulary before, it's actually a really good resource. Um, it's free, it's online, it's a website, so then any of us can access it. Um, you've got um, all the prescribing information for individual drugs in there. So like your, your doses, common side effects, cautions, contraindications, the basics of things like renal impairment, pregnancy. It's got links to take you through to the MedSafe um, data sheets, so um, if you're wanting like, more detail. And then it's also got summaries of information as well, like for groups of drugs or choices of drugs. It's also, for some medicines, got patient information leaflets, and they're written um, you know, quite simply. They're just one side of an A4, rather than some of the, like you say, huge, <laughs> great big um, tomes of information that you, you sometimes get, say, from the MedSafe website. So if you've not checked out New Zealand formally, it's worth having a look. So what are the pregnant Pardon? Why would you pregnant? Um, I'll go through it in more detail, but it's just about trying to reduce the total amount of nicotine that you, yeah. yeah. And that's just one strategy, so yeah, but um, it's just about trying to minimise exposure to the nicotine. But like Rosie said, you're going to individualise again, you know, so if you've got somebody who can't manage that, stopping smoking is, you know, more important. So, you know, for some women, you're going to choose to keep the patches on overnight. So just going into those in a little bit more detail, um, we looked, I went and looked at you know some other specific medicine, um, some pregnancy and breastfeeding books that we've got, some other databases, and I did a bit, bit of a literature review. You know, so is it anything beyond there um, that that's useful in terms of having some of the risk benefit discussions with with the women? Because pregnancy and choice of drugs um, isn't necessarily just a yes no. You know, it, it does get a lot more complicated than that. So nicotine does cross the placenta, um, although there isn't any strong evidence of teratogenicity as such. Um, there is a theoretical um, 
concern about the potential effects um, of nicotine on, on the baby um, due to its vasoconstrictive effects. So the, there is um, thoughts that there's the potential for it to reduce um, uterine blood flow. Um, so whilst there's yet no studies that have um, actually shown malformations as such, um, Conversely, they're also saying we've not actually got enough information to say absolutely this is safe and there's going to be no adverse effects on the baby. Um, and it, the studies have also looked at it from the other angle in terms of comparing it to your outcomes um, for, for women who continue to smoke. And you know, there is benefit in terms of actually some of the outcomes, such as less likely to have low birth weight and less likely to um, have premature babies, even though the woman is being exposed to nicotine still. And obviously, really important, um, you know, you're not getting all the other toxins that are associated with the smoking. Um, so just going back to that, actually, um, so combining all of that, I mean, Generally, whilst there's not a lot of trials to say absolutely this is safe, um, you know, because of um, the fact that you're only exposing to nicotine rather than all of those other toxins and possibly lower levels as well, then overall the studies and expert opinion say that you know using nicotine replacement is is better than is safer than continuing to smoke. Um, patch versus intermittent therapies. So if um, you can, or the, the woman can use the gum or lozenge, then she's possibly going to be having less exposure again to the nicotine than having a constant level from the patch. Um, some may not tolerate or the gum or lozenge very well, either just because they don't manage it in general or because of things like um, morning sickness. So they might not um, be able to manage with gums and lozenges, so might yeah, go with the patch again. And so these are just some of the strategies um, suggested. So um, even if they're struggling to at least try and reduce their smoking first, even if they don't um, stop, obviously easier said than done. Uh, wear the patch for the 16 hours, because like we mentioned earlier. Um, and try and keep, if possible, to a, like a, a reducing schedule. So again, that throughout the whole pregnancy period, you're just keeping your, your nicotine exposure to, to a minimum. So with breastfeeding, so yeah, nicotine's excreted in breast milk. Um, question mark over the you know the actual potential for adverse effects though, because it is only excreted in in low levels. So, and um, the, obviously again the advantage of not being exposed to other um, byproducts of smoking. The amount of nicotine in breast milk does vary between NRT products and also how those NRT products are used. Um, so, for example, there was a case um, where the use of the 21 milligram patch was equivalent to the um, smoking about 17 cigarettes a day. So it's not that you know, like, you, you know that the nicotine isn't <laughs> present in the breast milk. Yeah. yeah, but in general, it's considered that it's very low levels in breast milk. So yeah that you, your baby's not going to be exposed to anything too significant. And again, um, you know, in terms of just reducing the baby's exposure, um, using intermittent products if you can, um, but say it better don't work for everybody. So again, nortriptyline does cross the placenta, um, and there have been some teratogenic effects um, in case reports or epidemiological studies, but um, there's not been a clear causal relationship um, established um, compared with the or to the nortriptyline. Um, epidemiological studies have also um, suggested that there might be an increased um, risk of preterm birth. Um, so because of those two, oh, mainly the teratogenic effects, um, avoid if possible, especially if in the first trimester. Another aspect to it is if you're using it um, throughout the pregnancy or in the third trimester, and you possibly get a possibility of withdrawal symptoms in the neonate. So that might be changes in blood pressure, jitteriness, um, sleeplessness, um, maybe even seizures in some cases. Again, not to clean excreted into the breast milk. Um, low concentrations though. Um, 
And in general, it's not usually detected in the actual infant serum, although some of the metabolites of the naltriptyline <coughs> have been present at low cases, but not in all instances. So you'll see some case reports where you know the, the naltriptyline is, um, is detected in the infant serum, in other cases it's not. Um, but then translating that into well, what actually happens to the baby, um, at immediate adverse effects in the baby haven't been reported. So, um, and one study has looked at um, whether the drugs or the naltriptyline is accumulated in the baby, and there was no evidence of that even after 50 days of the mother breastfeeding. So. So it just goes to yeah, giving you some reassurance um, around the safety. Um, then the other thing that often gets looked at in terms of pregnancy and breastfeeding is that um, we might not have any immediate side effects, well, you know, malformations, we might not have any immediate side effects, but is there any actual adverse effects um, on growth and development because of the effects on the baby's brain? But um, there's a limited amount of follow-up, but so far um, there's not thought to be too... Um, adverse effects on the on the baby through the naltriptyline. But interestingly, um, like when you look at the different resources, some of them describe naltriptyline in breastfeeding as having minimal risk, and then others, yeah, maybe of concern. So, I mean, a lot of the time when you get in these sort of queries, you know, you you are having to have a good look at the literature in terms of. Um, not just looking at one source of information, you know, actually having a look at multiple sources because it, you sometimes do get conflicting advice. Mm -hmm. um, um, so again, it does cross the appropriate, it does cross um, the placenta, and my, but most human data suggests that um, it's pretty low risk. And data is inconsistent about possible heart defects. So two studies showed that there was heart defects um, in babies or risk of heart defects in babies um, following exposure to bupropion in pregnancy, um, but subsequent studies have not actually demonstrated the same. So inconsistent data around that. Um, so the, the more recent studies suggest that, you know, that that's maybe not the case. One study, there was an association with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Um, and another small study that suggested that there was increased risk of miscarriage. But for all of those, um, like the heart defects, the ADHD and the miscarriage, there's thought to be a number of potential confounders that, you know, there were other things that were going on for the mum for the um, and um, other drugs that were taking, continued smoking, etc. So again, like that, that data is not um, particularly strong. Um, some authors, though, are suggesting that because of that um, potential risk, um, and so it might be safer, if possible, to wait, you know, um, till after the first trimester before you can start. And in terms of long-term effects on the baby, they've not been studied. So again, it's excreted into breast milk, low levels in the infants, um, and here the, there's actually been some measurements um, of the equivalent um, dose in babies as to um, what it would be in the mum. So they call it a maternal weight-adjusted dose. And some of the ranges have been from like unquantifiable, so that you know there's, there's nothing that's measurable in the baby's sin, um, serum, through to um, 2% was an average in one study, and then another study showed a range of um, 1.6 to 10%. So in general, that maternal weight adjusted dose is considered safe if it's less than 10%, um, although some authors would suggest 5% for, um, for psychotropic drugs. So for the majority of the bupropion case studies, you know, it's within those limits. Uh, there are limited data on actual adverse effects in the baby, though. There has been one report of seizures. Um, that was just one case report. Um, there have, and then that's not been repeated or reported in other small studies or other women yeah, who've taken the, the bupropion. However, um, they do suggest that um, although the low levels are expected in the milk, um, if you are going to use it during breastfeeding uh, to monitor baby for 
the sort of side effects that you uh, might expect if you're taking bupropion. All right, so varenicline is interesting in that we don't know if it crosses the placenta, um, but because of the type of drug it is, um, we're expecting that it will pass into the baby. Um, but interestingly, the data sheet, which, you know, data sheets come from the drug companies and when you come to pregnancy, they're often a lot more cautious. Um, they actually say that the data that's been published um, indicates that there's no greater risk of malformations or other out per outcomes, such as prematurity or small weight. Um, a lot of the other resources said that the data is inconclusive or inadequate on which to base a decision. So. Pardon? Um, and so, again, then having to weigh up the, um, the question over is it safer to um, continue than conti um, use phrenicline than continue smoking? So we've got, um, we do know, or we're supposing that it will actually be passed to the baby, and we've got some information to say that there's no greater risk of malformations, um, but so then again, like the risk of that compared to the smoking. Similarly, to the breast, for the breastfeeding, we don't know if it's actually excreted into the breast milk, um, but it probably is. Um, we don't have any reports of um, effects on the infant, and so general suggesting that avoid if possible. Um, you might be in the scenario where there's somebody you know has been using it in in pregnancy, so you might wish to continue it. Um, so if so, then again monitoring the baby for the potential adverse effects such as vomiting and the seizures. Renal impairment, a lot more straightforward than the pregnancy and breastfeeding, um, you know, because you're just going to be looking at what their actual renal function is, Ollie, um, and then, you know, a dose according to the guidelines based or reference sources based on how it's excreted. Um, you just then need to monitor, you know, if the renal impairment's change, your renal function's changing. So nicotine replacement, so it's actually the liver that's mainly responsible for the metabolism and elimination, so you don't need to worry too much until you've got people in severe renal impairment. Bupropion, it's metabolised, it's active metabolites in the liver, which then go on to be excreted in the urine, and so the recommendations are that if you've got an EGFR less than 50 mils a day, to use 150 milligram. As your renal function declines, then you're more likely to get accumulation and increased chance of side effects of the bupropion. So keep an eye out for dose, um, side effects um, even at the 150, and particularly if the renal function continues to decline. So um, brenicline is about 92% excreted and changed in the urine. And so then this one has got um, dosage recommendations if you get down as low as 30 mils per minute for your um, EGFR. And nortriptyline, so um, different again. So you need, don't need to worry until you've got your EGFR less than 10 mils per minute. So like, yeah, really severe renal impairment. Okay, so myocardial infarction and acute coronary syndromes. So nortriptyline is fairly straightforward. Like, you know, when you go to your different resources and your recommendations, it's um, contraindicated in the immediate um, post-MI period. Um, and if you're talking about patients with cardiovascular disease in general, or, you know, a little bit further out from your MI um, that you've just had, um, it's still got caution and should still be used with care. You know, there's a risk of sinus tachycardia, that it's prolonging the QT interval. Um, it can cause or contribute to arrhythmias. So, yeah, generally avoiding your nortriptyline when you've got cardiac disease. So, um, again, there's cautions with the NRT um, because it's not actually been, again, proven safe, you know, so it's like that, you know, converse again. So, um, proven safe when you've got patients who are hemodynamically unstable, and um, particularly if they've got arrhythmias um, um, or they've just had their MI. Um, but is there an actual concern in acute coronary syndrome? Again, there's a theoretical risk. So we're talking that because of its vasoconstrictive properties and its effect on the adrenergic system, that it can potentially increase cardiac demand by increasing the heart rate and the blood pressure. 
But in general, it's thought that the cigarette smoking itself is going to increase um, that demand more than um, your NRT is. Yeah. In terms of evidence, um, there's only been a couple of trials actually looking at smoking cessation in this in this population group. Um, one of the and one of those was in stable cardiovascular disease, and one of them was actually in acute coronary syndrome. Um, so that was a retrospective study um, published in 2012, um, and that showed that um, using NRT after an acute MI, there was no adverse cardiac events um, greater than um, not using NRT um, for a year after the acute coronary syndrome. So we have got some evidence of safety there. And so in general, um, the New Zealand formula suggests that um, yeah, using the NRT outweighs any risk of using nicotine. So I mean that generally nicotine's or nicotine replacement's your first line therapy. So example, when you are in hospital, you know, and you're needing to have some sort of smoking cessation support. Hmm. Is there any, do you have any studies that have look at risks of acute withdrawal post MI as against treating for withdrawal NRT? Not studies, I don't think, I mean there might be but I didn't come across them, but yeah, like I guess a couple of authors of the papers have commented that whilst again there's that theoretical risk, yeah, like you're much better actually dealing with the withdrawal symptoms, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and this is um, just showing you, um, it was a a meta-analysis, so a, a, a combination of a few different trials, um, showing um, the number of patients that have um, been involved in trials that are looking um, in cardiovascular disease. So we've got a couple there with for NRT, we've got those for fibupropion, and then we've just got the one for varenicline. And here you can see we've got, um, so the NRTs, we've got one in stable, outpatient cardiovascular, this is the one that I mentioned um, like post MI, so with you, you had your um, safety for a year post MI, and then we've actually got um, more with the bupropion, um, and you can see here then we've got three as well that are actually looking at um, acute um, MIs and acute coronary syndromes, whereas the varenicline is just um, your stable cardiovascular patients. So it's got a caution with cardiovascular disease, um, although it's debatable about whether there actually is an increased risk of cardiac events, um, similar for some of the other um, medicines or um, clinical situations. Um, there's like a couple of studies um, where um, Vrenicline was used as smoking cessation, um, and then patients who already had cardiac disease then went on to show a greater risk of subsequent adverse effects or cardiac adverse effects um, when they were taking the varenicline compared to placebo, but then that's not been replicated in, in few, um, further studies. Um, so the trial that was mentioned on that previous slide um, about um, acute coronary syndrome was completed fairly recently. Um, so, and you've got the details there, so 302 patients uh, followed up to week 24, so a lot shorter than um, with the NRT trial. Um, not So MACE is major adverse cardiovascular events, and um, not really any difference between the varenicline and the placebo. Um, but there were two deaths in the placebo group, uh, um, sorry, in the varenicline group, um, where there was none in the placebo. So the authors just commented that they, you know, that wasn't really clear why the difference, but because the numbers are pretty small, it's hard to draw any real conclusion from it. And so, yeah, not powered to fully assess safety. So whilst it's a start of saying that varenicline might be okay, you know, it was only 24 weeks and we've only got really small numbers of patients. Um, bupropion, it's not got the same cautions in cardiac disease like your other drugs have, you know, so when you go to the data sheet, it's not, um, doesn't caution you in the same way um, as your nortriptyline and varenicline, um, but it does say that there's limited clinical experience with this acute 
stuff, so recent myocardial infarction or unstable heart disease. But as you'll have seen on that previous slide, there are actually three studies in that sort of scenario. And these are just a couple of them which show that um, for your major cardiovascular events, your, your um, rates of adverse events are not actually too different between your bupropion and your placebo. They're not showing any statistical significance. And again, in this one as well, um, no statistical significance. But again, just note the numbers. You know, they're pretty low numbers of patients, so it's, just, it's difficult to be really conclusive. But say, bupropion has actually got more evidence with it than, than the others. Okay, mental health. Um, some of the mental health medicines have um, got, you know, cautions, as John mentioned earlier, in terms of their use. Um, but this is coming from a bit of a different clinical perspective in terms of if you... Um, If you've got people on mental health medications and um, they're stopping smoking, what's the effects on their um, med routine medicines? So smoking and liver enzymes. So hydrocarbons um, associated with smoking your tobacco induce production or activity on your various liver enzymes. And so what does that mean in practice? So there's a few, well, quite a lot of different liver enzymes that are involved in metabolizing drugs. And if you stop smoking, what it means is that this particular... Oops, wrong button. So one of the enzymes, the CYP1A2, um, the activity of that is reduced. And so if you've got a drug that's metabolised by that 1A2, then you actually um, get increased levels of the drug from stopping smoking. Uh, just as an extra... Point. So CYP1A2, as in a lot of these liver enzymes, you'll get what's called polymorphisms or genetic differences. So you might, whether you're smoking or not, the rate at which you metabolise the drug can vary depending on um, your own particular um, genetic makeup. And there are ethnic differences in um, those different, um, I guess, polymorphisms. And... For some of these different liver enzymes, they've been quite well defined for some population groups. Um, for CYP1A2, it is known to vary quite a lot between individuals, um, but for um, if you're talking New Zealand population and Māori, as yet, there isn't anything published around um, differences for that particular enzyme. So um, SSRIs. Um, not substrates of SIP enzymes, um, except for fluvoxamine, which isn't um, funded here. So, you know, re no real concern with changing doses, etc. Tricyclic antidepressants, when you stop smoking, the plasma levels can increase. That's mostly noted for clomipramine and imipramine. Um, it's not, it might do for amitriptyline, nortriptyline, but that's not as well established yet. So it may not be clinically significant, but you do need to monitor for adverse effects because um, that may indicate that the drug levels are rising. Metazapine, um, plasma levels might rise, but probably only to a small extent, so it's possibly not clinically significant in terms of um, increased adverse effects. Looking at the antipsychotics, um, you've got a couple here where the levels may rise, but it's generally not clinically significant levels likely to rise with these ones. So this is where we've got to be cautious. Um, so you, you're going to be looking to reduce your doses. Um, chlorpromazine um, is quite variable. Haloperidol might increase by about 20% and flufenazine 20 to 50%. So you can be looking to reduce those doses. Um, maybe not straight away. You might be monitoring for side effects. Clozapine and olanzapine, we'll look at it in more detail. So, despite what I said earlier about, um, you know, what all, all our enzymes are different, um, so um, it's possible, though, that you only need 7 to 12 cigarettes a day to cause maximum induction of your clozapine and olanzapine metabolism. And you can get um, a 20 to 70% 20 to 70 difference in your clozapine levels, although it's often approximated as 50%, and 20 
to 50% difference in urolanzapine levels as well. So quite significant changes. And, you know, for something like clozapine or these drugs, you, you're going to get quite potentially um, severe side effects. So some of the recommendations, reduce your lansipine dose by 25% when you stop smoking, but because um, you know, some people get inc um, greater increases in their levels, then you might need to um, further monitor for side effects and further reduce the dose. Clozapine, varying recommendations are available out there. Um, uh, Fionn had one recently and she said it's quite difficult sometimes, you know, to actually translate that into practical, um, you know, recommendations. So in terms of, well, what does a 10% reduction in dose mean and how do you translate that into the number of tablets, etc. Um, this is one that goes into quite a lot of detail, so um, it's available on the internet. Um, so they actually talk you through in quite a lot of detail around actually, you know, doing a baseline risk assessment and thinking not just automatically about a set dose reduction but thinking where where are they in terms of their clozapine plasma levels how close are we to the toxic effects um, do they actually need um, a dose adjustment if they're clinically unwell so we're effectively giving them a dose adjustment by stopping the smoking um, um, and then continuing to adjust according to the clozapine levels Obviously need to think then the other way around when they start smoking again. Thinking about your patients with repeat admissions and discharges, if you've got lot, um, so, you know, no smoking um, during the hospital admission. Cannabis, so smoking marijuana also in, um, increase, uh, increases your liver enzyme activity um, through um, the hydrocarbons. And if there's smoking, cannabis, and tobacco, it's an additive effect. So NRT, so that doesn't change. So this is, um, I guess, something that sometimes people get confused about because you're still thinking nicotine. But remember, it's the hydrocarbons in your smoking that's causing the change in your, in your um, induction of your enzymes, not your nicotine. So e-cigarettes, um, possibly similar, but you'll know more about that this afternoon. And just a general thing, um, you know, if you know patients are looking to stop smoking, do you and they know that you know, some of their other medicines might actually be affected? So thinking about that when patients are um, looking at smoke, stopping smoking. So there are other medicines that are affected by um, those liver enzymes as well, so that you might want to bear in mind. So warfarin, which is obviously um, potentially quite risky. Things like theophylline, benzodiazepines, methadone. So there's a few that you need to be aware of. Um, I'll whiz through these. Um, so this was about which smoking therapy to choose. Um, so it was a case with a 26-year-old female who was taking metazapine, had a previous overdose with amitriptyline. She was also taking PRN, rizotriptine for migraines. She'd failed NRT twice, struggled with the vrenicline for the nausea, and she'd like to try another medicine. So thinking about rupiopine or naltriptyline, um, pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic interactions, so are there any additive effects or any... Um, metabolic interactions. So some of those, some of the other things to think about, so you might get additive CNS depression if you're adding naltriptyline to metazapine, increased risk of serotonin syndrome, or bupropion through effects on a different liver enzyme system can in possibly increase metazapine levels. Could you just remind me, what's the um, brand name of metazapine? Ivanza. What is it? Ivanza. And other things that you might need to think about are things like your overdose um, risk. Um, so naltriptyline um, is another tricyclic antidepressant. So she's also already on uh, risotriptan. Um, so that's an, another drug that can increase your risk of serotonin syndrome. So you're potentially going to have three, three things in there. Um, so 
you're possibly going to be going for your bupropion um, and monitoring for your adverse effects. So this has already been mentioned. Um, this came to us as a query for some evidence around um, the safety. Um, that was the background to it. So um, the patient had tried NRT. He'd very nearly finished his course of Renaclean. And he had cut down a lot. Um, he got down to five or six cigarettes, um, which sounds pretty good from coming from 20 plus. Um, but as John had said, he, we want to get people off completely, but he was feeling really stuck. And the query was, well, the doctors in the respiratory clinic sometimes use Renaclean and NRT together. So is there actually any evidence that that actually works and is it safe to do so? So if you look at just some of the basic um, like resources that we go to. It doesn't come up with any drug-drug interactions in terms of cautions. The data sheet suggests that there might be additive side effects, um, but states that the safety and efficacy in combination with the other smoking therapies has not been studied. So I had a look for some papers. There are actually three studies of the combination, and then they've been nicely collected together in a meta-analysis. So those are the details of the three. Um, this one, the second one here was the biggest with 216 patients um, on the therapy. You can see there's 15 or the 16 hour patch, 16 hour patch, 24 hour patch. Um, all of them started the brain and clean in the same way one week before the quit date. Um, this one was different in that they started the patch early as well. And these are the results. So this is the first table is looking at the early outcome. And if you're not used to looking at these, um, what they call forest plots. So if you've got um, one of these squares to the right of your vertical line, it favors um, the therapy, so combination therapy. And the further you are to the right, the better. And if this line crosses, if your horizontal line crosses the vertical line, then there's um, some patients that didn't do quite so well. So the, better, the further you are to the right and the further away your horizontal line is, the better. So you can see that the biggest study um, and the one which started the patch early was showed the most effectiveness. And then it was similar. Um, so for the late outcome, which was um, only 24 weeks again, um, again, the second study with the most patients and starting the patch early showed the most effectiveness. Side effects, a little bit um, additive effects there. So looking at um, possibly increased side effects when you're using the combination. Um, and then just in terms of funding, as well as what we'd, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's evidence to say that it might, you know, it might be more effective, um, possibly increased risk of side effects, but some of those could be managed but yeah, if you're looking at funding, um, then you can't use special authority processes for doing that. Um, and just in terms of um, other combinations, um, bupropion and NRT, again, there's been a number of trials and there's evidence to suggest that it might be more effective or there's a trend to increased effectiveness over just using one but it didn't reach statistical significance, and the same with the Vrenaclean and NRT. Again, there's a trend to increased um, effectiveness, but not statistically significant. Although, yeah, the same. <laughs> you do, you know, for some patients it's going to work, some patients it's going to work really well, and you do, yeah, as long as you, you're bearing in mind your increased risk of side effects, then yeah, you, you do what you need to do for the patient. You just, yeah, bearing in mind that it's, it's going to be outside your licensed um, recommendations and funding. Mm -hmm.